you have a working knowledge of your nervous system, your skeletal responses, and your involuntary responses. What we have to think about is how your senses, both your specific senses that are associated with organs and general senses that are associated with your entire body actually impact those responses of your nervous and muscular system. So when we talk sensory receptors, what we're actually talking about are structures that are specialized to respond to stimuli. And what we have to study is how those receptors are going to generate electrochemical messages in response to that particular stimulus. So when we look at sensory reception or your sensory receptors in your body, we look at how you respond to both your external world and your internal organs. We have to keep in mind that your sensory system is not only responding to an external environment, things like the smell of fresh baked cookies, but also we have to look at how your sensory re system is going to help you keep homeostasis, okay? So its purpose is to trigger an action potential that would be associated with your nervous system. But it's also going to send information to the central nervous system that has to be processed and, and perceived and considered. And what we look at is the sensation that you actually feel or interpret depends entirely on your brain and how it processes that information and receives that particular action potential. The whole process is something we know as sensory transduction. This is the idea that you have a receptor that's picking up a stimulus. It's going to convert it into an electrical signal, and then we're going to send that to your brain to process and deal with. Now, sensory receptors. The receptor themselves are very, very specific to particular stimuli. By that, I mean you are not tasting with your eyeballs. Okay, so we have to figure out how these things work and, and process this information. So if we look at your taste buds, your taste buds, let's say you eat something sweet. What happens then? Well, the sugar molecules will actually go into your taste bud, which is in your tongue, not on the surface, but inside your tongue. And what we're looking for is those sugar molecules to actually bind specifically to sweet receptors. You have different taste receptors, okay? And when we bind those, we're going to look for what we call a signal transduction pathway. This is going to send information to your brain saying that a sweet receptor was triggered and your brain says, ooh, it's sweet and you process that through your memories. Have you ever had this sweet thing before? Does it remind you of something? Does it taste like something you've had before if you've never had it? And then we look for some sort of response. Typically in the case of tasting something, when your brain knows that there's something in your mouth, you're going to produce more saliva to help start the digestion process. But the receptor potential is what we actually look at as a very, very boring chemical scientific explanation for how you sense something. It is not romantic in any way. It is simply this idea that you are causing a flow of ions to flow through your membrane potential and create an action potential. Very kind of dry and boring, right? But what we have to think about is it's responding to these signals, whether they be chemical, like taste and smell, electrical, like light, temperatures, pressures, anything like that. We have to keep in mind that if the stimulus is sensed as being stronger, so if you have something that is really, really sweet or just a little sweet, how does your brain know that? Remember 
This is all based in frequency of the action potentials, not strength, right? The amplitude or the height of the action potential does not change, right? It's all about frequency. Are you sending more signals? The more signals you send, the stronger the stimulus that you perceive. So what happens over time? We look at many things that we adapt to. You put your clothing on in the morning, and by the end of the day, or hopefully much before that, shortly after you put on your clothing, you don't notice them anymore, right? This is something we refer to as sensory adaptation, and this is the idea that some sensors, not all, some sensory receptors will become less sensitive with multiple stimuli. If you've ever turned off your alarm clock and not remembered turning it off when you wake up hours later, you have adapted your sensory system to your alarm clock. Time to find a new alarm clock. This gives you the basic chemical structures of what's going on with our sugar example. So if you're going to taste sugar versus taste salt, it actually goes to different parts of your brain. And as you increase the sweetness, notice you increase the frequency of the action potentials. Or if you taste something that's more salty, you're going to increase the frequency of the action potentials, not the strength or not the height, right? They're all the same height. Remember, action potentials are all or none events. You either get a signal or you don't. You don't have an option for a, a larger signal in that regard. If you want to tell your brain that something is sweeter or more salty, you increase the frequency at which you send the signal. So what's the difference then between sensing something and perceiving something? So sensing, you actually don't have any control over. Sensing is your body saying that it is aware that a stimuli exists, but you don't know what that stimuli is yet, okay? What we look for is your perception of that sense. So that means that you have some sort of conscious awareness. This seems kind of like psychology mumbo jumbo, but we have to keep in mind that in order for your brain to tell you what that sense is, you have to process it. You have to relate it through your cerebral cortex. through your somatosensory cortex to your motor cortex to actually tell you what's going on after you integrate and have some knowledge of, of the scenario. Depending on your receptors, these sensory receptors, many of them have a very, very large what we call receptor field. So we look at these particularly with touch. You can look at them with other senses as well, but I think touch is easiest to think about. And what we're looking for is the idea of sending in a sense, right? Any sort of stimulus. So these are dealing with afferent neurons. Do you remember what an afferent neuron is? A was for away from the stimulus, so some of you may know these as sensory neurons. You're sending a signal into the central nervous system, okay? But what we want to think about for the moment is how specific, how pinpointed does that stimulus have to be for your brain to be able to understand what's going on? Take this receptor field. For, for letter A here, versus letter B. These are single axons, right, coming out. So it's, 
It's dendrite, cell body, axon. Hopefully you remember that from our discussion of your nerves. But you notice this dendrite has a very small area it's associated with versus these dendrites that are covering a very large area for B. Why am I so interested in this? Well, what we have to keep in mind is that if the receptive field is smaller, you would actually have better precision for pinpointing the actual exact spot of a sense. What do I mean? If I touch you, if I touch right here, or if I touch right here. Both of these nerves are going to send a signal to, a brain, to your brain. But what we want to think about is in A, if we touch, you have a very small area where that touch could be perceived and where you would find it, right? Versus B, you touch, you send a signal, and your brain just knows that it's in this large area somewhere because it came from this specific nerve. It can't tell you more precisely than that. So we actually measure this in a, what we call a two-point discrimination test. And what we look for is how much information is going to your brain and how are you interpreting that information. So if we have afferent neurons here, A, B, and C, sending in inf information, the dendrites for each are in our circles here, so A, B, and C. And what I'm interested in is this point of stimulation that they did right here, okay? And what they're showing you is the action, freq action potential frequency. So A sends a few, C sends a few, and B sends a whole lot. Well, why, does a, why do A and C send any if you are touching right here? The more overlap you have between these receptor fields, the more precise you can be in locating the actual point of stimulus. This is less important for things like temperature and cold and so on, but if you want to know and your brain needs to know exactly where a bee has stung you, we want to know exactly where we can find that and you very quickly can look to where that bee is stinging you or mosquito is biting you because you've got good discrimination, you've got good receptor fields overlapping telling you exactly where that bite is.